One of the most hotly debated topics in all of Christianity today is the role of women in the churches. We're talking about whether or not they can be pastors or not, or if they can even preach the gospel to men. Is that prohibited in the Bible? Some people believe so in the church or even outside the church. I've even featured a few videos in which there's been pastors saying that women are not even qualified to teach other women the Bible or children, that even that role of teaching is reserved for men only. I think that's a very extreme position. But there are good reasons why there are those who believe that women should not be pastors in the church. Tradition teaches that in many respects. I grew up in the kind of church my whole life. They didn't have to tell me women weren't qualified to be a, a pastor of a church. By practice, that's what I saw. That's what I believed most of my life until I studied the matter in, in Scripture thoroughly and I was blown away by how loudly God speaks through his word, and I've written a lot of it down here, that really changes everything. And when you compare that to the proof text used to silence women or to say they're not qualified for certain roles, and then you look at what the Greek words were used that Paul spoke that's rendered into English, you see that some changes were made to, in our modern Bibles in particular, to really silence women and to divide the body of Christ. And all right, so I'm going to share with you some of these things that relate directly to the core essentials of our faith in women in the New Testament. A little bit about what God did with women leaders in the Old Testament. I'll run through this pretty quickly. But first, the reason why I'm doing this video, of course, is because this week the SBC is meeting in their annual meeting. Whether you belong to a Baptist church or an SBC Baptist church, as I do, or not, is, is, is still relevant for Christians. Here in the United States, the, the largest Protestant denomination is the SBC. And they voted today on whether or not to officially ban women pastors. So if it passed, which it did not, by the way, it failed. They needed to get two-thirds approval. They didn't get quite enough, so it failed. But it, had it passed, they would no longer cooperate with any church that it's not just ordaining pastors. If they even affirm that position, even the language included affirm women pastors, it did, even if they don't have them. But also, if they would employ or, or ordain a woman pastor in their churches, they were no longer in friendly cooperation with the SBC if this thing had passed. And it wasn't just, you're thinking probably the senior pastor, of course. No. This issue has come up because there have been women put in the role, given the title pastor, over the youth. A youth pastor. Right? And there have been women pastors over other women, like over women's Bible studies and so forth in some large churches that have multiple pastors. And even that was considered. No, 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 that's out. And of course, 1 Timothy 3, qualifications of elders and deacons is often reiterated. In another video, I'm going to go through all those proof texts, just like I do with Calvinism. They've got their proof text to try to say this isolated text they pull out says that God determined who will be saved from beginning of time, and that number is set in stone. God unconditionally elected those who will be saved. They'll all be saved. Everyone else is going to go to hell. And this is what our confessional statements say. They're reform, systematic theology, and it's right. The Bible proves it, but they ignore so much of the Bible and just isolate certain texts to make that point. The same is done with this role of women stuff. They're isolating very few proof texts, completely taking out of context all the other things that Paul wrote about women, and it, it causes great confusion and it divides the body of Christ. And right now, I've already got some people probably tuned out who don't agree with me, who are leaving a nasty message, calling me all kinds of names that I'm not, because that, that seems to be the strongest argument for that side of it, that if you affirm or believe that God calls certain women to preach the gospel to men, as he did with the Great Commission, I'll get to that, um, that somehow you're some wacko leftist liberal feminist LGBTQ supporting, and the names go on and on and on, all of which is false. And every single time someone writes that, which you'll probably see in the comment section, they are lying. They are bearing false witness. They are sinning. They don't know anything about me. And I'm telling you, everything I believe and teach on this channel only comes after I have thoroughly studied it for usually years in the Bible. And like many people, I grew up in a church that did not practice any woman leadership. I go to an SBC Baptist church now that doesn't have a single woman leader in the church. Right? I personally hold the different view because I have studied it thoroughly in Scripture and I changed my mind. I looked at all the writings of Paul. So it's easy to just affirm what you've always been taught by tradition. 
But when you, let me redo this. This is, a, this is something I practice, right? A little something I wrote down years ago. And I've always kept it with the biggest obstacle to truth is the belief you already have it. Let me, let me repeat it. It's worth repeating before I get to this list of things that relate directly to the core essentials of the Christian faith and how God used women in that. The biggest obstacle to truth is the belief you already have it. The people who have already tuned out this video when they found out that I'm going to support women preachers and women pastors, right, are already thinking Beth Moore, Joyce Meyer, liberalism, feminism, they've already, they put up the wall, they've already blocked what I have to say, they're not interested in the truth, they think they already have it, and they've already shut down the video and left a, probably a bad comment or just moved on. That's a sad thing. Because I'm not here to mislead anyone. I want to tell you what the Bible truly teaches and so forth. So let me just go through a few things. And in another video, because I don't want to make this a long video, I will go through each of the proof texts, show you what it says in the Greek, show you absolute proof from Scripture that Paul was not prohibiting women from anything. And in fact, did ministry work with a lot of women who preached the gospel, who taught men, who started churches, who led churches, all those things. And that concept goes all the way back to the Old Testament. But anyway... So here, here we go. I'm going to run through a bunch of firsts. Who was the first to be told Jesus was coming into the world? A woman. His mother, Mary. That's the first one. Why, why, didn't, why didn't that get run by the, by the husband-to-be, Joseph, right? No, God just didn't see fit to do that. He sent an angel to speak to Mary. Okay. Who was the first to evangelize Jesus as the Messiah to non-Jews? That was a woman at the well, John chapter 4, right? First to evangelize Jesus as being the Messiah to men that were non-Jews. Who was the first to anoint Jesus Christ with oil, preparing him for his death before most of the men following him even knew that was going to happen, couldn't even understand it? Who anointed his body, preparing him for the cross? A woman, okay? Okay. Which followers stood at the foot of the cross as witnesses to the crucifixion? Almost all the followers of Jesus that were men, the apostles, scattered and ran in fear. Not Apostle John. I loved the Apostle John. John stood there, but so did the women. The women were witnesses of the crucifixion. And much of the Bible and our faith in God's word is based upon their witnesses to the death, burial, and resurrection. And in each case, it was women who were the key witnesses to the death, burial, and resurrection at a time in a culture that would not allow, allow women's testimony to be allowed in court. It was deemed unreason, uh, un unreliable on the sole basis that it was a woman. Understand what that means. That means the men of that day were not interested in truth. They were more interested in the outward appearances of who's delivering the message. So it wasn't the message that mattered. It was the messenger who mattered. Imagine if that were true of the good news of the gospel. Oh, no, it's not the gospel that matters. It's who's delivering the message of the gospel that matters. And if it's a woman, it's not true. If it's a man, it is true. How silly is that? And yet that's what we have with a lot of thinking of men today because they want to use the Bible not to lead those to Christ that need to know Christ. They use the Bible as a weapon to fight a culture war. And I'm so disgusted with the whole LGBTQ agenda, feminism, current politics, the way society is decaying. I'm, I'm right there with any number of you who are sick of that. But it doesn't, it doesn't, it, that's not the lens through which I read the Bible. I read the Bible through the lens of what Scripture says and how Scripture interprets Scripture. And, you know, Scripture was not written with 2024 American politics and society in mind. No, no, no. It, it's way beyond that. And so let, let's go on. All right, the first, um, who first witnessed the resurrection and told the men? You all know that one. Of course, that was, that was women. Well, I mean, and by the way, the resurrection is the key to Christianity. Paul in Romans 10 talks about this. Without the resurrection, our belief in Jesus is in vain. He had the power to lay down his life freely, to give it freely, and the power to take it back up again. Had he not taken it back up again, there would be no truth to Christianity. There's lots of people in false religions of the world that believe in Jesus. I mean, think about it. I mean, you have, you have the Jews who believe Jesus was real, but they believe he died and didn't raise from the dead. You have 
the second largest religious group of the world outside of Christianity, which is Muslims. And Muslims believe in Jesus too. And they don't believe he died. They believe that he was some kind of prophet who ascended to heaven. They didn't believe in his death. They have a different Jesus than Christianity. But in Christianity, we believe both that he died and that he raised from the dead. And so that's a key distinction between Christianity and every other religion of the world. But, all right, so who first witnessed the resurrection and told the men? Women, I just mentioned that. Don't you think God could have chosen men for that at a time when women's testimony was not even valid? Right? It's, it's, it's amazing how that's what God chose to do. What is the body of Christ, which is all the believers in Jesus, compared to in the Bible? It's compared to being, it's called the bride of Christ. Now, this may ruffle some feathers of some men who have shallow egos and can't handle the truth. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Doesn't bother me one bit. That's not a, a slight against my manhood or masculinity in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> I'm not concerned about it. It's just what the Bible says. All right. Who did Jesus give the Great Commission to to preach the gospel to the whole world? It, was it just men? No. It was everybody who's a follower of Christ. He gave it to all of us. And we see that played out in Pentecost, that all those who were the 120 went out and preached the gospel. That was the very beginning of fulfilling the Great Commission. I said I was going to come back to this. In Acts chapter 1, the Great Commission is given again. And then he ascends to heaven. And then there, the 120, which included women who followed Jesus according to Acts chapter 1. Now in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes Right? And they receive power from the Holy Spirit, and they miraculously go out and preach, all 120, men and women. This is the launch of the early church. So God chose to start and launch the early church with the preaching of both men and women. And that doesn't say they were all pastors, mind you. But anyone who says that women aren't to preach the gospel to men is in direct violation of what happened in Acts chapter 2. But more than that, it says a, a 3,000 souls were saved that day and baptized. Who do you think baptized 3,000 souls? If you follow the logic of what happened about there were 120, there were men and women. They all received the Holy Spirit, all 120. All 120 were given utterance. That means they all went out and uttered what was being coming through them with the power of the Holy Spirit, which was the gospel heard in the native languages, all of them. And 3,000 souls were saved and they were baptized, which means the 120 were the ones baptizing the men and probably women and children, whatever, who were saved. So absolutely, women baptized men in Acts chapter 2. It would be inconsistent to say otherwise, right? Um, so why did Apostle Paul commend women for their ministry in Romans 16? I mean, he commended a lot of women in Romans 16, of which was Priscilla. Priscilla was one of them. She's mentioned a, a few times in the book of Acts. Her and her husband taught Apollos the gospel. They both are credited for teaching him. Oh, but we're going to look at 1 Timothy 2 and say, oh, that was a violation of God's divine order. She was totally out of line teaching Apollos the gospel. Well, apparently it worked out because Apollos is stated right after that as winning many Jews to Christ. And he's mentioned again in scripture by Paul. He was a leader of the church in Ephesus. He was very impactful with his ministry. And it started with being taught the gospel by Priscilla and Aquila. Who, by the way, I was watching a John MacArthur sermon about the about Revelation and the letter to the church, the seven churches. And interestingly enough, when you he by the way, I would say he's the poster child for pastors against women pastors and preachers. He did a viral uh, sermon in 2019 called Does the Bible Permit a Woman to Preach? I've done videos about that uh, particular sermon. I've watched it many times. Notes, Bible in hand. It was a mess. But it went viral, influenced a lot of people, a lot of unbiblical teachings in that, a lot of reading into the text in that sermon. And the reason why he did it was because just prior to that at a conference, he did the famous, you know, Beth Moore Go Home. Quick edit, everyone. Sorry, but I forgot to circle back as to why I mentioned John MacArthur and the sermon I heard him give about Revelation and the seven churches. So in the sermon, he's focusing on the Ephesian church, and he brings in a, an historical fact about how it, was, how it began. 
I found it very interesting. See, John MacArthur in that sermon is not on the topic of the role of women in the church. He wasn't trying to defend something he had said publicly. He's just talking about the Ephesian church. And he brings in this historical fact that it was launched and led by Priscilla and Aquila. So they were the first pastors of the church. It was then led by Apollo II as, as Priscilla and Aquila went off to do their missionary work elsewhere and launch other churches. Um, they would become martyrs for that, by the way, in case you didn't know. But the second pastor of the church was Apollos, and the third pastor of the Ephesian church was Timothy. And John MacArthur taught on that. And interestingly enough, one of the thing. oh, by the way, before I get on to the second thing, um, why should that be strange to anyone? I mean, after all, I've already explained to you that there was men and women among the 120 at Pentecost. So God launched the early church as a whole with Holy Spirit-filled men and women. Why would it seem strange to anyone that very shortly thereafter, a local church would be launched by a Holy Spirit-filled man and woman? I mean, it, it, it's, it's totally consistent. But there's a lot of people who want to falsely claim that no women ever led a church in the early church or in the Bible. And it's, it's just there. Obviously, Paul commends Priscilla and Aquila for their ministry work in Romans 16. And speaking of Romans 16, actually earlier in the video, I mentioned um, the importance of the resurrection, that without the resurrection, Christianity wouldn't even be valid. It, must, it depends on the resurrection. Um, Paul emphasized that. That was actually 1 Corinthians 15. I misspoke and said Romans 10. I meant to say 1 Corinthians 15. But anyway, so also on John MacArthur's church, Grace Community Church, they have women in the role officially and with the title of deacon or deaconesses. And I was watching this conference that had Justin Peters and Phil Johnson. And Phil Johnson is John MacArthur's right-hand man at Grace Community Church. He's also a pastor there and an elder, I believe. And he's also, uh, he does the production of the Grace to You radio program for John MacArthur. And so they were discussing their differences on the role of deacon. And Phil Johnson was explaining in this, and by the way, I featured this video. Um, well, maybe I'll put it in a card up here somewhere. You can click on it and go see it later or maybe at the end of the video. But uh, Anyway, um, Phil Johnson was explaining why John MacArthur believes women are eligible to be deacons, despite the fact that in 1 Timothy 3, it says under both elder and deacon, the husband of one wife as a qualification. And so a lot of people use that phrase to deny women that role, say they're prohibited from that role. But look, if you know anything about Paul's teaching on marriage, you know that Paul was big on God's design for marriage, one man, one woman. And you could read Ephesians 5 and get a real taste for God, uh, you know, Paul's teaching on marriage. And he's consistent throughout. And, and so when Paul is writing the husband of one wife, a couple things about that. Number one, he's not prohibiting women from either role. He's prohibiting polygamy. He was against polygamy. Polygamy is the disqualifying factor. And scripture is often written by men to men but in such a way that they would understand it to mean it was applied to everyone. It was a masculine form of writing, very common for the time, and we should not be confused about that. And so that's how that's written. Here's another example of Paul writing in the masculine form. See, if you were to read a very important Bible verse about Scripture in general, you might come to 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. And I'll read it to you. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This is an important understanding of scripture for all men and women to have. Scripture is, is for all men and women. It's not just for men. And so nobody misunderstands that verse, even though it clearly says for the man of God and does not include women in it. And that's just one example. We could do this over and over. And I've even done a video on this where I've showed it over and over and over again, the masculine form in scripture that we apply to both men and women. But in 1 Timothy 3, people love to ignore that and try to divide the body and say women are to be silent and they cannot have these roles. And I, I, that's not the intention Paul had for that verse, for, that, for that, uh, that, that chapter. And secondly, I mentioned Justin Peters. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll go say this as well before I get back to the video. And that is, uh, there are those who will falsely accuse someone like me of supporting women preachers or pastors and say, well, you just must love Beth Moore and 
Joyce Myers. I mentioned them before. Understand that's a false association. I don't support them at all. I don't watch them. Don't know enough about them, even one way or the other. I don't care what the, what they're doing. Right? It's not, I don't, I'm not supporting anyone who's a celebrity preacher, male or female. I'm just not into that. And so when people try to associate you falsely with something or someone that you've said you don't support or never mentioned at all, understand that they are lying. That is a form of lying. When you try to create a false association you have no basis whatsoever for making, that is a lie. It's bearing false witness against another person. It's a sin. Okay, And so it would be equally as crazy if someone said about Justin Peters, well, because he supports men to be pastors, he must support Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland because they're obviously men and Benny Hinn was a pastor of a church at one time. Kenneth Copeland is a pastor of a church. So you make that association with them and Justin Peters. Well, that would be outrageous. That would be totally silly. And it would be a lie. We all know he's against those guys for theological reasons and other things and so forth. And likewise, when it comes to Justin Peters and John MacArthur and Phil Johnson, they're all Calvinists, and I'm against their theology of, of, of their reform systematic theology, totally against it, because it's all false and it's not true. So I wouldn't support them. And likewise, I'm sure they don't support my view. <laughs> and that's too bad. I don't, you know, I'm just telling you the truth in scripture. So Today in society, we have a lot of compromising churches that are affirming sin. And this is why people that are Christians, it's somewhat understandable to me that they would, okay. And they start to want to use the Bible to condemn people when that's not the purpose. The purpose of the Bible is so that we would save people like by introducing them to Jesus and be light in the world and let scripture do the talking. It's the power of God and it's the living word of God. But instead people use it as a tool to fight a culture war and to condemn other people. When Jesus himself said he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world would be saved. And people instead are using his own words and the words of Paul to condemn other people rather than show them God's love, mercy, and grace towards them. Uh, and, and they're trying to condemn them and fight a culture war, making enemies of people when our enemy is Satan and demonic forces and their influence in the world, not the people. Right? We're supposed to you know, love the people and bring them the light of the truth. And you know, guess what? If someone's drowning, they're going to die and someone throws them a lifeline. I don't think they care if it's a man or a woman throwing the lifeline. And the world around us is decaying and people are dying in their sins, not knowing Christ. And anyone who would preach the gospel of truth to them is like throwing them a lifeline that they can cling to and be saved by Christ. It's insane to try to take half the body of Christ and say, you're not eligible to do that. Right? <laughs> anyway, back to the video. But there's a lot of false teachings in a lot of churches, and there's a lot of compromise on sin, and there's a lot of people who are affirming sin. I wouldn't support any one of them, man or woman. But most of the leftist agenda and liberalism and feminism that have crept into the mainline Protestant churches today has not been at the hands of women. Whether they have women ordained as pastors or not is irrelevant. Most of that influence is from men. Sadly, sadly enough, still, it's still men who predominantly do write most of the books about the Bible, are the theologians, are the Bible school and seminary teachers, are the Bible study writers, are the pastors and leaders of churches. I go to an SBC church that's there's not any woman in leadership at all. That's all men. All the pastors are men. All the elders are men. All the deacons are men as far as I know. Maybe not. I don't know about the deacons, but so I don't want to say that. But but all the men, all the leadership roles are men. Right. I don't agree with that. It's not reason enough for me to leave the church, mind you. Uh, I'm not gonna, that's not the hill I'm going to die on. But I do think it's sad when people m misread the Bible and come away with a doctrine or a teaching or some kind of legalistic rule that divides the body of Christ. I mean, half the body of Christ is women, roughly speaking, approximately, right? And to want to silence half the body of Christ is ridiculous, and so these things God did in the time where clearly things were divided by gender uh, in, in, tr in tremendous ways. It's God spoke loud as can be. But wait, what, what about the Old Testament? See, God, someone will tell me God never put a woman in leadership over men. Certainly not spiritual leadership. Oh, really? Let me see. What, did God ever establish a woman in the Old Testament as a spiritual leader over men? The answer is yes. God raised up Deborah to be a judge. She was also called a prophetess. She uh, uh, led the army, which was led by a man named Barak, 
and they were going to go free the captives, and they did so. But Barack wouldn't even go unless Deborah would go with him. Okay, that just go read it. It's in Judges chapter 4, I believe, right? Prophetess Holda. God spoke through the prophetess Holda, a woman, to advise the king and the people. Esther. Esther is a perfect example of spiritual authority over men. She is actually a type of Christ in the Old Testament in that she was willing to die to save her people. And before she would go before the king to try to save her people uh, out of order and in such a way that the guards might kill her because that was the law, right? She decided to tell Mordecai to instruct the others that they are to fast for three days before she goes before the king. Now, I don't think she thought they were just all overweight and they needed to lose some weight, so just don't eat for three days. No, that spiritual fasting, that, that was a spiritual exercise, fasting for three days. And the fact that a woman, Esther, is the one who commanded it to be so, and they followed it, shows she was exercising spiritual authority over all those Jews, including the men. And God raised her up for such a time as that to do exactly that, and she succeeded. And so I think it's important um, to understand that in the Old Testament, now there, there are others, there's Lydia, there's, there's, there's some others we could go. I just want to give you some to let you know that God established that he will put in charge who he puts in charge, right? He will call. Not everyone will obey the calling. There are people who will put a stumbling block in front of those who are called to preach, those who are called to evangelize, those who are called to be pastors. And in the rules of organized religion, if it can put a stumbling block in front of a woman to prevent her from doing that role, then that is dealt with in Matthew 18. Jesus spoke about those who put a stumbling block in front of his children. As men and women who are born-again believers, we are children of God. We're, there's women, there's men, and God sees us all in such a way that he is no respecter of persons. And that's true of Christian and non-Christian people in general, but specifically in the body of Christ. God has Jesus as the head of the church, and we are all part of this body. And we all have a different role to fulfill, but God chooses what the role is, and it's through the Holy Spirit that we're equipped to do it. If we won't quench the Spirit, but in obedience, go do it. If people just don't get in the way. And the, the world is lost and needs more voices and more leadership. Now, let me, let me end on this example in politics. I want to I want to paint a picture because I, I do know that a lot of the people who are against women, preachers and pastors, are like me. Whether you're thinking I'm this or not, I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm a staunch conservative. B both in the way I, the Bible is my sole authority, but also in, in society and politics. Staunch conservative. Always have been. Right? And so it troubles me all this leftist stuff. And I don't like to talk about politics that much on this channel, but let me just give you this example. <clears throat> and it let it serve as an analogy as the church has a mission. The main mission of the church, the body of Christ, the believers, is to fulfill the Great Commission. That's to preach the gospel to the lost. Like it or not, that's the mission Jesus gave the church. Okay, so we want to persuade people that the gospel is true, the Bible is true, that they can be forgiven of their sins and they can be made new in Christ by preaching the gospel. All right, now let's look at politics in the United States. We have mainly two parties, Republican Party and we have the Democrat Party. We have people from the right to the left in both, but mostly the Republican Party is considered the, the right, the Democrat Party is considered the left. Right. <clears throat> Imagine what would happen to our laws in not only the federal level, like in the Senate and the House, but even in our individual states. I'm so blessed to live in Florida, where we have the best governor in the world, and a legislature in Florida that's reasonable, that protects children from the radical left and the leftist liberal and LGBTQ agenda. I love the F Florida for that reason. But imagine if at the federal level and at the state level and even the local level, the Republican Party across the board said, no more women in politics. That's a leftist idea. And look at all, look at AOC and look at all the, look at the things that they're for. We don't want women like that in our party because they'll do the same thing. What? If you look at the, the political parties now, there are lots of solid conservative women in politics, in the Republican Party. Imagine if you eliminated them all, saying they're not qualified. We only want men to be leading in politics. 
And all those leftist women, we'll, we'll let them go over to the, the Democrat Party. So now you would have nothing but men in the Republican Party and men and women in the leftist liberal Democrat Party. Now, a young woman being raised up in the world today with conservative parents, what's the likelihood she's going to look for a, a female role model in different aspects of life, whether it be entertainment, but even in politics and in politics, when she looks for someone to look up to, that's a woman she can relate to and finds none in the Republican Party. How do you think that person's going to vote now? She's going to find a woman that she can relate to and she's going to be listening and being influenced by the only voice she's hearing in politics from women, leftist agenda politics. And the voice of the woman in conservatives and conservative values, the voice from women will have been silenced by idiotic men. And ultimately, the Republican Party will shrink and shrink and shrink. And we won't, we will find everything is blue, including our states like Florida. That's not a recipe for success. I, I, and, and I know that we cannot necessarily directly use an analogy from politics into religion and the church and so forth. But in some, some level, it's the, it's the same, which is why I believe Jesus gave the Great Commission to all followers. This is a time in the end times we are living in, where I like to say it this, it's all hands on deck. This is not a time to be divisive in the body of Christ. There's so many lost souls. The Bible says, Jesus said, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. There's a lot of so-called laborers that want to take the other, the, the half the body of Christ and say, don't be a laborer, get out. We don't need you as leaders leading them to Christ. We are the men, we'll take care of it. And look what has happened to the Christian churches in not just the United States, but in Western societies and so forth. Do you think in third world nations, in places in poverty, they care as much about the gospel being preached from a man or from a woman? Not at all. All you can do is look at the world around you. You can look at where some of the most hot, the hottest growing areas, not the shrinking areas of Christianity, like in Western society, like the United States, where Christianity is shrinking, but in the places where it's expanding, you see people preaching the gospel that are men and women. They're united in Christ to be light in the world. And that is how Christianity spreads. And the good news of the gospel is given to those who need it. This bickering we have here in the SBC over can women be pastors or not, Oh, if they're pastors, they'll just lead you into leftist liberal. That's a lie. That's a lie. If a woman or a man, either one, becomes a pastor in the SBC and starts preaching heretical views and left, that church should be considered not in friendly cooperation with the SBC. That's the way it should go. We should be judging churches and their leaders on the content of their message. Is their message correct? Not on who's giving the message, but is the message correct? And unfortunately, there's a lot of men who are shallow with very uh, fragile egos who see women in the body of Christ as a threat to the so-called authority they want to have over them. It's a sad thing. There'll be more I have on this topic in the coming weeks or months. Um, as I said, I will be talking about the proof text because there will be people who leave a comment who say, oh, 1 Timothy 2, 11, 12. No, sorry, that's about marriage and marriage only. All you can do is study it. You can clearly see the context. It's about Adam and even childbearing. It's a nonsense, non-starter to even consider that. Just go look at the Greek word for man. It's used often in the Bible for husband, right? It's about a woman who's married to not uh, 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 usurp, which means to illegally take the authority away from the man, her husband, because God established that as part of marriage at the very beginning, right? In marriage, in the in the marriage the family and the household, God established the husband to be the one who is in charge, the authority. That's the order of it. The church is an institution that didn't happen in Genesis chapter 3, right? Um, or 2, whatever, but it was, it was established in Acts chapter 2. That's when the church was launched in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. It's a different institution. And to, to say that men have to be the leaders of the church, well, got an issue. 
a man is the God man, Jesus Christ. <laughs> He's the head of the church. And we are one body. And Galatians 3 and 28, Galatians 3 verse 28, it's a great chapter, by the way, but that verse in particular, Paul spells it out. Do you think Paul contradicts himself? No. And he, he made it clearly that in the body of Christ, there is not, the way God sees it, it's not, there's, not, there's not Jew and Greek. There's not free or slave. That's social status, right? And there's not, you know, male or female. But we are one in Christ. That's the way God sees it. God is not a respecter of persons. But God does have specific um, spiritual gifts he wants to equip us to fulfill the, the work of ministry, to reach the lost, edify one another in the body of Christ. And that is a calling of God, not, not for people to rule over and, 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 and create these little special hierarchical uh, organized religions. People are trying to create this hierarchy within religion. And they're trying to build their own little kingdoms on earth instead of building his kingdom. It's sad. Anyway, more to this, more on this to come. That's all I got for today. Thank you for watching, and may the peace and love of Jesus Christ be with you now and forever. Amen. Bye-bye.